Welcome, everybody, to Lutheran Library. Lutheran Library is a podcast of Transcendent Truth Media Network. If you'd like any more information about what it is that we're doing, uh, other podcasts, blogs, uh, books, whatever else, uh, go to www.transcendenttruthmedia.com. Now, I'm very sorry about my camera. I have really no idea what's going on with it. But I look horrible. And, um, I mean, that sucks for you. Oh, well, you know, uh, yeah, too bad. Couldn't fix it. Don't know what's going on. I When I used it in the camera app, it was working just fine. And then when I use it in Zoom, it looks like trash. So I don't know what that means. I'm not enough of a nerd to uh, figure out what it means. Um, I don't care. Maybe I'll just buy a new camera. Who cares? Right? There we go. Uh, crosses to bear. Am I right? So today we're continuing on walking through Luther's work on uh, the German mass and the way he understands it. Last episode, we were basically mostly talking, um, it was really just like one or two pages of his writing, but uh, talking a lot about uh, lectionaries and how he understands the week and especially in parish, parish ministry, how the divine service fits together with the daily offices and catechetical preaching and the texts that he uses and Lectio Continua and all that stuff. But today we're getting into the uh, real juicy bits. He's going to pull out the, lit the, the, the liturgy for us, uh, the Sunday divine service, and he's going to pull it apart. Tell us how he understands it. Um, and so that's what today's about. But before we get into that, there's this really interesting line that it kind of mirrors and it kind of echoes uh, that which we have in the Apology of the Augsburg Confession, Article 24, Verse 1, which is that we retain the vestments, we retain the ordinaries, we retain the liturgy of the Mass. Um, and and here we have something similar. I, mean, I think I, there's nothing in the Apology about candles, but there is here. Um, and so he says here, let me just read this to you. Here we retain the vestments, the altar, and candles until they are used up or we are pleased to make a change. Now, of course, um, this is similar to the apology, but it is not identical to the apology. Uh, one difference, um, you know, aside from Luther's statement here, including things that are not included in um, the apology here, because in the apology, just as we also keep the traditional liturgical forms, such as the order of readings, that being the, the, the lectionary and how it's fit together, the prayers, right? So this is the liturgy itself, vestments. And I mean, you could say that it's included in Melanchthon's phrase where he says, and other similar things. I, I think you could do that. That's fair. But here it's pretty explicit. Um, he's, he's saying explicitly, we are to keep the altar, and we are to keep the candles. I don't disagree with him at all. As you, as you all know, I'm very traditional liturgically, um, and not not. We discuss the traditional liturgic liturgics in the Lutheran context and why that's kind of not it's not real. It's not, especially if you want to go and you um, watch the video that I did with um, Evan the uh, patristic Pentecostal. We were talking a little bit about that then, but just as it is now, um, if you go back tradi to traditional Lutheran liturgics, especially the, like early Reformation stuff, it's just Tridentine Western Catholic stuff or, or pre-Tridentine Western Catholic stuff. If you go a little bit beyond that, then it's a reaction against Tridentine Catholicism, right? If you go beyond that, then you're looking at pietism. You're not really looking at anything Lutheran particularly. You're looking at something that looks a lot more like uh, historic Reformed uh, embodiments of, of theology being practiced. So, um, yeah. And so what what we see here is Luther carrying on this kind of theme that I have not, not been walking with him 100% in, where he's kind of engaging in this sort of, um, not rejection of, but a pushing back against a lot of the liturgical things that he's seeing. He's, of course, he's not pushing back in a, in a literal sense, but more of in a... Um, kind of of a, of a veiled threat, if you will, to those who love these things or think we should use these things, right? And for in one way, I, I get a lot of why this is because Rome at the time and, and beyond this as well, and even now, uh, states that these things are necessary to be doing. Of course, we don't think that they're necessary to be doing. There, no one thinks it's necessary. It's not a command of God to wear vestments. It's not a command of God to have an altar in the way that we have it, to have candles in the way that we have it. Um, However, I don't think we should get rid of it. 
uh, or them. Neither does Luther here in the literal sense, but he says we're going to use them until they are used up or we are pleased to make a change. So he's kind of emphasizing um, wh maybe what he sees to be something about an arbitrariness to the whole matter, whereas I I don't. I, I look at this as, you know, this, this is what has been ground out for 2,000 years if I'm not going to be the one to make the change. N neither are you, nor should you be. Um, we cannot uh, compete with 2,000 years of ancient Christian tradition. We can merely contribute to it. Um, and so, uh, by the way, these, these vestments that he's mentioning, it's not up for debate what these are, right? And, and this, is, this is kind of a, uh, something that has peeved my soul. When, for example, we see many Lutheran Church Missouri Synod pastors um, insisting that the chasuble be rejected or that the chasuble be not worn for a reason that it looks Catholic or something. And they say, oh, no, 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 we are, we are using the, the vestments because we have the alb and we have the sanctuary and we have the stole. And it jokes on you, buddy. Uh, the vestments, in Luther's words here, the vestments in AP 24, verse 1, what do you think it is? It's the vestments. And you're missing one of them, at least one of them. You're missing more than one. I'm not going to tell you what they are right now, but... And so in a lot of ways, actually, Luther got his way in many instances in what we see as contemporary Lutheranism, where it is not as liturgical as the traditional church was and or is, right? But it is, it, it did make changes. It, it was not conservative in the way that it kept everything. It was conservative in the way that it reduced the ex liberal extravagancies of so much of um, medievalism. And and I agree with a lot of that kind of um, whittling down of those liberal eccentricities, but I, I'm not going to agree with the full extent to which so many of our contemporary Lutheran brethren have done it. I think we should be wearing the chasuble. Of course, I don't think we need to be. Nobody does. I think we should be using altars. Um, I'm not going to say we need to, um, but it is fitting. It is true. It is good. If you go actually to the ecumenical councils, these things are there. Um, and so a lot of this does have to do with how we understand those ecumenical councils, how we understand tradition, how we understand even how, how to worship and how to uh, live together as co collective uh, body and liturgical church. So he continues, but we do not oppose anyone who would do otherwise. Now here I'm going to say I probably would oppose anybody who would do other things. And uh, but this is not the uh, this is not the episode for me to oppose those people. Okay. He says, however, in the true mass of authentic Christians, and here again he's using these kinds of <laughs> um, pregnant terms that lean towards or lean into his kind of pietistic leanings, right? That there is this select group of authentic Christians, unlike normal Christians, right? And he says the altar should not remain where it is, and the priest should always face the people as Christ doubtlessly did in the Last Supper. Now, of course, what he's getting at here is that in the medieval era, um, altars were fixed to the wall, and actually still in most confessional Lutheran churches, they are fixed to the wall. Of course, you see the altar behind me. It's called freestanding. It's not fixed to the wall. Luther got his way in, in St. Matthew's Lutheran Church in Cornwall, Ontario, okay? But the, the thing is, he didn't get that until very recently. Um, Lutherans did not follow him here. He wanted all altars to be ripped off the walls and put this way so that the pastor can stand behind the altar facing the congregation. We call this versus populum. Uh, if it's fixed to the wall, we call this ad orientum, right? He's facing the east, liturgical east, right? Or if he's facing the congregation, he's against the people, right? This is the ideal. Now, he is his his reasoning here is not the one you get from the average uh, lay, usually lay women who say, "I don't like I don't like that the pastor's facing the wall. I don't like he's facing away from me. That's so rude." You don't hey, you don't see the the same reasoning being used here. Luther doesn't care about it being polite or rude or sentimental. What he's getting at is when the Lord administered the Last Supper. Now, I'm not going to agree with him that it was versus popular. I don't think it was versus popular. No one sits at a table that way, right? Nobody stands up on one side of the table with everyone else on the other side, actually not even sitting at the table. So no matter how you do this, it's not going to be that way unless you try and do some kind of long table Lord's Supper like the... Uh, um, Scottish Covenant or Presbyterians are doing, um, but, you know, and that that that's a broken system too, because then 
what we're embodying is not a what we should what we should be doing a representation of this thing but we're um representing it not in a representing it um but in in a, in the form of a skit right we're doing a memorial of of the last supper and that's not what holy communion is the sacrament of the eucharist is not a skit it's not a memorial of jesus's last supper that's not what it's supposed to be and so i'm not I'm not really seeing his whole point here. Um, I see it a little bit. I just don't think it's very valid. Moving on. He says, and this is beautiful. He says, to begin the service, we sing a hymn or a German psalm in in the first tone as follows. So uh, if you don't know, psalms are sung in, in tones. They're psalm tones. In the LBW, I think there's eight or nine tones. Other service books have higher. They sometimes have 12 tones or less tones. Um, and so what he's talking about is we are going to take what was generally done. For example, this was called the intro at Psalm, right? You would do the first verse of the Psalm of the day or first verse of whatever Psalm, and it would be in Latin, a language that people didn't know. And so he says, we're going to make this German. Now, now we're singing in German. We're singing in a language that the people know the word of God is going to instruct the people here. Um, and it's going to be a full Psalm. He, he said he wanted to take this, this one verse intro it and make it a full Psalm. This is one of the best things he ever did. One of the less good things he did is also in this same sentence, where he says, we sing a hymn or a psalm, right? I don't think that that's, that that's um, a good exchange. To exchange the word of God for the word of men, this is, this is a loss every time. I don't care how much you love your hymn. I don't care how doctrinally sound your hymn is. Your hymn is not the word of God, right? And if you're doing one thing, you're not doing another thing. Now, to bring up the Scottish Covenanters again, yes, they are singing exclusive psalmody. No, I do not think we need to be singing exclusive psalmody. But I do not think we should be beginning the service with our words rather than God's words. There is a place for our words. There is a place for our um, uninspired written hymns. It's just not in the place of a psalm, right? And so if there is already a place for a psalm, I'm not going to put a hymn in there, right? You add hymns. You do not replace God's words with hymns. Do you understand basically how, the, how, the, how this works, right? Uh, people say, for example, in, in, in our context now, um, the readings as part of the liturgy of the word go Old Testament, Psalm, New Testament, Gospel. Of course, the, the intro, it's a separate thing that's going on here. How would you feel if I replaced the New Testament reading with a letter from C.S. Lewis? How'd you feel about that? Hmm? You probably would not feel good. Now, that doesn't mean that there isn't room for that kind of stuff. Obviously, there is. It's called the sermon, right? That is not scripture. That is my words as the pastor, right? It's me preaching God's word, but that does not replace God's word. It is added to it, to expound it, to open it up, and to proclaim it and apply it to the people in the pews, right? So there's very different things going on here. I do not think that we should ever be replacing Psalms with hymns. Now, if you, uh, the thing is this, is uh, a lot of us have inherited a lot of the things that Luther wanted, which are not actually that good. Right. A lot of us have, I mean, actually, I think the freestanding altar is pretty good and there's reasons for that. I don't, maybe uh, I'll explain that another time, but basically the idea is that um, the direction in which we stand um, as the pastor, um, as pastors and ministers in the, in the service reflects um, our operation in persona Christi to the people um, as well as on behalf of the people toward God. Right. Um, and so when we are praying, when we are, um, doing the confession of sin, if someone is 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 engaging in the utmost liturgical propi propriety, they are facing the altar. They are facing ad orientum when they are speaking with one voice of the of the congregation. But when they are speaking um, in persona Christi, right? Um, for example, the the absolution or the sermon or the Lord's Supper, these things he is facing the congregation. So there's this distinct kind of change in direction when that kind of um, liturgical rubric, let's say, is used. But uh, no, I'm not going to, I'll follow him on this, on that. But um, as even though, mind you, again, historic Lutherans did not follow him there. This is a, this, this began to be a thing in like the 60s and 70s with Vatican II, when all the Roman Catholics ripped their altars off the wall and made them freestanding and started doing a Roman mass versus populum, right? 
So let's continue because now he's going to really break open the service the service um, for us, right? So this is um, just one example of his tone here. I'm not going to sing it for you, but this is the um, the psalm he he's given as an example. I will bless the Lord at all times. God's praise shall continually be in my mouth. O magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt God's name together. And it goes forward and it goes onward. Um, then he says, this is, of course, this, the same as, as our own, except with one difference. For his uh, divine service, his mass, he moves on to what? The Kyrie Eliaison. Where do we in contemporary Lutheranism, thinking of the LBW, thinking of the ELW, thinking of, um, I don't know, I haven't seen Wells' uh, service book, but I imagine it's the same, um, thinking of the um, LSB for the Missouri Synod guys, is we go straight into, from, from the beginning of that service, the introit or the invocation, however our congregation decides to do it, or the entrance hymn, as Luther was saying. And as, as I was acknowledging, this is the same thing we do at St. Matthew's. We use an entrance hymn um, rather than a psalm, although we should be using a psalm. Is that then, we, most, most of us in contemporary Lutheranism, we go straight into confession and absolution. But where does Luther go? And then after that, we go into the Kyrie. But he goes straight into the Kyrie. And, and I'll probably shock you from saying this, but historically in the Lutheran Church, confession and absolution was only a private thing. There was only auricular private confession between the pastor and the layman. There was no public corporate confession and absolution in the Sunday service. That did not exist, right? That came later, much, much, much later. Um and so this is not, don't expect to see this here. Don't expect to see this in pre-Tridentine Western masses. Don't expect this to see in, to be seen in the Deutsche Messe. It does not exist here, right? So moving on, he says, um, after, the, after this, the Kyrie Eliaison, and his is very short. It's actually only three phrases. This is very Western of him. And if you, if you ever get the chance to look kind of at how the different um, liturgies between West and, and East look, the East are... Uh, how should we say, long-winded. Um, lots of repetition, lots of uh, long, drawn-out litanies, lots of um, antiphonies and um, antiphonal uh, litanies and all such things. Whereas in the West, it's very precise. It's, it's, it's short, if you will, right? Even now, and now it's, it's, it's even shorter than it's ever been, but same as in Luther's day. But now you go to a daily mass and it's, it's like 15 minutes and you're done. You're in and out, right? So... And here is Kyrie, is, is simply Kyrie eleison, Christe eleison, Kyrie eleison, right? That's it. After which he says the priest reads a collect in monotone um, on F as follows. Tone F, that is, right? And he gives an example of a collect here. But this is the same as we have now, collect for the day. Um, except what is he missing, right? From ours, right? From what is he missing from the process and the movement of the contemporary Lutheran liturgy? Well, for us, we go from the Kyrie into the what? The Gloria in Excelsis, or this is the feast, right? He doesn't. He just goes straight to the collect. So our collect follows um, these songs of praise. His does not. And so what, what basically we're seeing here is that the, the German mass that a lot of us probably assume um, the contemporary liturgy is based off of is not what the contemporary liturgy is based off of. They're related, um, but they are not uh, father and son. They are not mother and daughter, right? Um, and actually, if you if you look at the, uh, it's probably contrary to what people would assume. If you look at the contemporary Lutheran liturgy, it is more extravagant, more liberally majestic, if you will, than Luther's Deutsche Messe, right? Luther's German Mass is a simpler form of liturgy, simply put. So he, he then gives some rules for this chant, right? Intonations, commas, different comma, colon, period, question, termination. And these are musical chanting terms. But the same idea here is actually, interestingly enough, I've never seen um, the colic chanted ever. Um, I know that in... Um, I don't know if it's Vespers and Matins, but in the LBW, there is a chanting notation that looks like it's drawn from some kind of Gregorian um, for you to do that. But I don't, I've never seen it actually done in real life. I've never done it either myself in real life, except when I'm alone. So he says then of the epistle. So we're going straight from here into the readings, right? There is no, there is no Gloria. There is no, this is the feast. 
there is no confession and absolution at this point, right? Then he says, then we're going to go into the readings, right? He says he should read the epistle facing the people. And, and remember, I think it was in episode one. No, maybe it was in episode two in this series. Back in Luther's day, the lectionary was different than our lectionary. His lectionary was two texts. You had the psalm as well for the intro, it, but it was two texts, epistle and gospel. There was no uh, Old Testament reading. Now, he talks about using the Old Testament in other circumstances, but not for the Sunday morning divine service. So he says the epistle facing the people, but the collect facing the altar. Now, of course, here you must remember what I was just saying about liturgical rubrics and the um, representation of how we are standing as a instruction and an explanation of what we're doing and whose voices we are giving weight to, right? So just as we pray the collect, we do so facing the altar on behalf of the people of the church. When we read the epistle, and mind you, who's reading the epistle here? Traditionally in the Lutheran church, it's the pastor. Why is that? Well, if you go actually into the um, uh, pastoral epistles in Timothy, um, it's actually given to the pastor to do the public reading of Scripture. As um, Paul says in 1 Timothy 4.13, devote yourselves to the public reading of Scripture, to preaching and to teaching. Now, in line with AC 14, a lot of Lutherans have interpreted it in this strict kind of way where um, they ban uh, lay readers. Um, others allow lay readers. But this, this is why the, this is a traditional practice is that the pastor does this, right? And so he does this in persona Christi. He reads the epistle facing the people on behalf of God. After the epistle, a German hymn, right? So again, more hymns are coming in. Um, now, usually in the contemporary setting, the second hymn in the service is coming in after the sermon, not between the readings. So he's putting in one earlier than we would. And so he's, he, he says, either now let us pray to the Holy Spirit or another is sung with the whole choir. Now, also in Luther's day, the amount of hymns was far fewer. And so the hymnal is something memorized. The hymnal for these guys is something that is uh, repeated often. Um, and so it, it's, it's, it's forming o almost its own liturgy, right? So just as um, we have in, in, in our contemporary liturgies, Fos Hilarion in the uh, Vespers, that is a, that's a hymn. Uh, we have the Te Deum in Matins, that's a hymn. We have in the Divine Service, uh, the Gloria in Excelsis. Of course, these are pulled from Scripture. These are pastiches of Scripture, but nevertheless, they are, they are hymns. They are not verbatim um, things taken from the text. And so... In that same way, kind of, um, when you are using very few hymns and you are using them at the same point every single service, then you are building basically a new liturgy. Now, there, a debate can arise here and we can ask the question, well, are these hymns that Luther is suggesting better than the ones in the contemporary liturgy? And there, well, I mean, you can fight amongst yourself on that. Is now let us pray to the Holy Spirit better than something else? Is, for example, breathe on me, breath of God, better than, um, I don't know, Lamb of God? No, absolutely not, really. Okay, so... Then he reads the gospel in the fifth tone. Now, what I find interesting here is... Um, when, as, you know, as chanting becomes popular in the Lutheran church again... Uh, particularly in high Lutheran church congregations and um, liturgical parishes, um, liturgically minded parishes, I should say, is that the easiest way to do this is very obviously stick with one tone. But what I think is hilarious is Luther saying, stick with one tone. No, no, no. I'm going to assign tones to, <laughs> to different parts of the liturgy. And so the gospel is done in the fifth tone. Again, facing the people. This is in persona Christi, remember. So the rules for this chant, then he gives them, intonations, he gives commas, he do, and so he's he's not only telling you um, what tone to chant in, he's telling you how to chant it, he's telling you when to take a breath, when to pause, when to end, when to have a comma, when to have a colon, right? And he says, after the whole gospel, the congregation sings the creed in German. Now, this is absolutely beautiful. If you have ever seen the creed sung, of course, this is chanted, um, then you know what I'm talking If you've not, you should try it yourself. Um, as Augustine said, to sing is to pray twice, and make no mistake that we pray the creed. Also, here you have the uh, importance of understanding that when you sing, you are um, more so memorizing something than if you had just 
read the thing that you are singing. And so as we go, sorry about that. I actually, I stepped out for a little bit to go to a dinner party and then came back and I'm wearing completely different clothes, but same video. Here we, here we are, same book, same uh, author. So um, just as we were talking about singing, Luther's talking about singing the creed. And what's, what's really coming together here is that you have uh, don't don't get me wrong. This is a kind of not watered down, but it's kind of a stripped down liturgy than the one that we are used to. Let's say in contemporary Lutheranism, at least contemporary. Let's let's call it high church Lutheranism to use the 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 Anglican term, because that's really what what a lot of us are doing. Um, but what he has maintained here is what we would call the essential parts. Right? He has the Kyrie begging for the mercy of the Lord. I, I would probably switch out the, the Kyrie with a public confession and absolution, though. Um, of course, he's missing the, the Gloria, but he's still, he still has hymns of praise. Um, he has the creed. He has the confession of faith. He has the scripture readings. He has the sermon. He has, of course, and we're about to uh, go towards the, the Lord's Supper. Um, now, what's interesting about this as well is that he has not yet spoken about the sermon. Right, so as he was just saying that he has the the reading or the chanting of the gospel in the fifth tone, and then sorry, I I lost my page here, and then straight away he has the gospel confessed. Usually in our churches, in contemporary Lutheran churches, we have the order a little bit switched around, whereas the creed is. Um, the congregation's response in faith, right? Uh, the confession of the faith given to them through um, the word read and the word preached, confessed back, either prayed or or sung. Of course, he's saying we should sing it, and that's a that's a beautiful thing. And actually, if you look at traditional Lutheran liturgies for so many decades, for centuries in the Lutheran Church, the entire thing, uh, the entire liturgy, whether we're talking about the Deutsche Messe or the Kirche Ritual or um, the common service for the early American Lutherans, the entire thing was sung. And now you go to so many parishes and the entire thing is spoken. There's almost no singing whatsoever. Um, and, and you really, I guess, see this come to bear on congregations that are still attempting to do matins and or vespers. Because, for example, um, that is an entirely sung service. right? I mean, a lot of people don't, really recognize that the amount of singing in the divine service is not that much. But you switch that over and you go over to, for example, Vespers. So I have the, we at St. Matthew's, we are using the LBW. And there, there is musical notation for pretty much the entire thing. I mean, the Our Father doesn't have uh, chanting notations. It's not pointed for chanting. Although traditionally we would chant that as well and the collects as well. But um, there is really seldom uh, a text that's part of Vespers, which is not either noted or pointed for chanting. And that's a, a thing that we, I guess, have lost in the years present being lived. I mean, the, the LBW is not even that old. It's from 78. Um, but even that, that is, that is intending for us to be singing that much. And you go to so many congregations and barely any of it's sung, barely any of it's chanted. You go to so many congregations now and the psalm isn't even being chanted anymore, right? Have you look in our psalters? The whole thing is pointed, why? For chanting. It has tones. Why? For chanting, right? And yet we just read it. And I've heard, I've heard from people, they say, well, I, I feel like it's more prayerful when I speak it. That doesn't make any sense. It's not, that's not true. In fact, it's the opposite. Again, as St. Augustine said, to sing is to pray twice. Now, don't don't get upset for me saying that twice in a video, because remember, this is like hours apart for me. I went and did something else, and I came back. Forgive me. So, he says, um, then, finally, after the singing of the creed, then comes the sermon. And again, if you remember back from last episode, he's not really giving um, the pastors either the freedom to choose what to preach on, and he's not really saying, use the lectionary as a whole, which is what I would say to do. Rather, he's saying, you are particularly going to be preaching the gospel reading for that Sunday. The gospel text. Not the gospel as the thing in the doctrine. The gospel as in the gospel reading from, um, whether it's Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, 
right? He says, then comes the sermon on the gospel for the Sunday or the festival day. And I think that if we had the German postal for the entire year, it would be best to appoint the sermon for the day to be read entirely or in part out of that book. Now, here's something that is probably going to sound wild to you, probably going to shock you. What is it that Luther is talking about here with this uh, this church postal and the sermons in a book? Well, that's literally what this is. Have you ever met an Anglican, right? They have something called, instead of the Book of Concord, they have what they are called um, the Anglican formularies. That is their confession of faith. It's not just what they call the 39 articles of religion. It's also the Book of Common Prayer. It's also a third one, right? What is that? The Book of Homilies. Just as the Anglicans have the Book of Homilies as their confession of faith, and not only a confession of faith, literally a Book of Homilies to be read, right, in place of a sermon, so also the Lutherans had the church postal, right? And this was intended, clearly in this writing at least, by Luther, to be read either in part or in whole, literally in place of the sermon. Why is Luther saying that? Luther's saying that because these are dire times. Right? This is not a normative ideal. This is an ideal because the situation that is normative is so bad. And later on, there's going to be a visitation of the churches called the Saxon Visitation, right? And there he's going to write the Saxon Visitation articles. Um, and that's where they're going to come from. But what that visitation had to do with was the fact that these churches had no idea what they were doing. They launched themselves into the Reformation. They tried to become more word-focused, but the priests were so poorly educated, the laity so poorly educated because their priests were so poorly educated that no one knew what they were doing. No one knew the Catechism. No one knew the Lord's Prayer. No one knew the Ten Commandments. They didn't know anything. How are you going to preach a sermon if you don't even know the basics of the faith? That's the problem. And so Luther's dealing with a world here and a church here where the problem is not how can I best set up my fellow preachers, my fellow pastors to optimally be delivering and expounding the word of God in the pulpit for the bettering of the church, for the consolation of souls and, and, and for the forgiveness of sins and for the growing and maturity of the theology of the congregation. That's not his concern. He's not able to have that concern yet. He's trying to say, how can I catechize my pastors? Not, not into being fit to be pastors, into Christianity. Because they don't know what it is yet, really. I mean, that's really the situation. And so his basic idea here is we are going to set these. These are a set of sermons, right? And you're going to read these, right? These are based on the gospel, some are based on the epistles, right? And this will not only um, deliver the goods to your congregation, but it will deliver the goods to you. It will train you on how to preach. Now, and this is, again, this is, Anglicans have this too, right? This is not some kind of Lutheran invention. This is not unique to Lutheranism and the Reformation. This was a Reformation solution to a common Reformation era problem, at least in the early Reformation. It got, it got far better, right? So in, in a way, we could say, look, it did work. But what I find interesting about this is that it reminds me of that, um, I don't know if you've been seeing, if you're on the internet at all, obviously you're on the internet, right? But you've maybe been seeing this controversy about the AIs, uh, the AI bots, the artificial intelligence bots that have been writing sermons, and people have been complaining about it. And they say, well, the sermon is good technically, but you can't, you know, this is not the way that sins are forgiven. And it, I go back here, and I'm thinking, I'm not so sure that's true. If the sermon is orthodox, if the sermon takes the word of God, it opens it up and expounds it and applies it to the sinner for the forgiveness of their sins, the consolation of their souls, and the growing of the congregation's understanding of theology and the doctrines of God for them, for their salvation. That's what it needs to do, right? And there are dire times when this is the solution, at least the one that went with and the one they went with and the one that technically did work. Is it ideal? No, it's not ideal. Is it the way I would have tackled the problem? No, probably not. Is it one way to tackle it, though? Yes, it is. Um, what would be a better solution? Well, you could say no sermons until everyone is trained properly. I don't know. You're dealing with um, a problem that is so elevated where every single parish congregation on every single street corner and remind you, churches were everywhere here, and they were all the same, right? So it's not like, and it, I mean, for example, in Cornwall, I go just down the street, and there's a Roman Catholic church. 
I go up the street and there's a, a Roman Catholic church, but maybe I go to the left, there's a Pentecostal church. I'm a, I pastor the Lutheran church. There's a Wesleyan church. There's a few other Pentecostal churches. There's some Baptist churches and so on, Presbyterians, Anglicans, Dutch Reformed. We've got everything here. But imagine they're all Lutheran. And imagine um, none of those pastors know the, know the Our Father. Well, how, how is this city going to run its Christianity? It's not. And so Luther devises this um, thing of church postals. Um, the Anglicans devise the book of homilies, and they intend them to be used by these pastors. Actually, one thing that's interesting about this is, is um, before this generation, the generation just, just passed here, right? Um, like the 90s, the 80s, even the early 2000s, there was something called, I think it was called the... Um, pulpit commentary series i don't remember what it was called exactly but it was published by concordia publishing house and it was literally a book of sermons on every day in the church year for the three-year lsb uh not lsb but whatever they were using right that the same lectionary um that rendition of the common lectionary and there was a problem where pastors continued like we're using it and a lot and they're their parish is new. Um, however, this this is still done in a positive way, I think, where um, in accordance with AC 14, when a pastor goes on vacation, and if the synod does not have a bunch of pastor emeriti, is that what the plural of that of emeritus is? Probably, I don't know. If the, if the synod doesn't have a, a plethora of retired pastors sitting in the pews to go and do supply preaching um, whenever it's needed or whenever it's even desired, then what are you going to do? You're not going to have a layman preach. You're not going to have a council member preach, right? Because they're not ordained to do that. They're not called to do that. They're not trained to do that. And so what is done in most congregation is a, read, a written sermon, either by their pastor or particularly written by Dr. Luther or somebody else, right? Uh, I've done this at St. Matthew's. I've had um, council members read my sermon um, in accordance with AC 14. Uh, we've had at some of my friends' parishes um, the reading of, 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 well, church postal, right? And so it's the same idea. It's, it's, it's this idea in the, in lieu of, um, what is ideal, you will do this. Right? so this is the idea. And he says, basically, this is his reason. He says, even, even if they were to, um, be preaching, they're not going to be preaching it better than this. And so for him, it's all about what is, what is better, right? However, he says something very interesting. And this is something that I, I think is totally missed in contemporary Western Protestant Christianity. Let's lump ourselves in with that group for now, um, even though it's not really to, it's not really true. But I think we have this problem too. In that, for just take the liturgy. What are the complaints we hear about the liturgy all the time? Right? Oh, it's just ritual. It's just empty, vain repetition. It's the same rote thing over and over and over and over again, right? There's no heart in it. It's inauthentic, blah, blah, blah. And they say it's not from the heart because it's just memorized. It's just ritual. It's just the same thing. It's not even written by you, right? So it can't be real. It can't be from your heart, right? And so they say you need to leave some room for the spirit. You need spontaneity, right? Now, taken to the extreme, you have pastors who go by this method. They would never read anything. No, no, there's tons of people who would never read a sermon in a divine service. But beyond that, I know pastors who will not even write their sermons, right? They won't read a manuscript because they feel like that's inauthentic. They feel like that's not spontaneous enough, that the spirit isn't present there enough or something because they were too responsible and wrote it out beforehand, right? And against this, right? Luther says, this is also one of the reasons why we're going to do that. He says, but also not just for the sake of protecting you from your bad pastors and for the sake of making it possible to train these pastors in how to preach and also for saving their time, right? But also for the purpose of preventing the rise of enthusiasm uh, and sectarianism, right? And, and enthusiasm, as we see in the, in the Book of Concord, as we see in Luther's writings, it means God within us. Basically, people who believe that God is within, that God is in your heart. That's why everything needs to be from your heart, because that's where God lives, right? Basically, we're talking about evangelicals here. Not evangelicals as in Lutheranism, because that's not what that word means in North America. By the way, in case you didn't know that, if you're a cradle Lutheran. Um, but evangelicals, like Baptists, Pentecostals, even Presbyterians, Dutch Reformed people, usually, um, especially like CRC, 
um, PCA types, right? These evangelical, you know exactly what this term means. Sorry, my camera's falling. But with these, with these people, the idea is, oh, it, it can't be written. It has to be, you know, in the moment. It has to be touched by the spontaneity or whatever, spontaneity of the spirit or something. Liver shivers, I don't know. Basically, this is this is pietism. Um, this is uh, charismaticism. And Luther uh, has no room for that, and neither do I, and neither should you, and neither does God. Um, if that sounds mean, oh well. I'm trying to set this camera up mid-recording. Mid Bad planning on my part. Let me pause this for a second. Sorry about that. And so how do, how do these enthusiasts, uh, basically, like, how does enthusiasm relate to written sermons, um, sermons being read, uh, which is exactly like the exact verbiage that Luther is using here, sermons are to be read, right? Um, which is something that would really chafe against the evangelical Western mindset. Because for them, they are placing a distinction between something that is read and something that is preached. And so they say, don't even, don't, don't read your manuscript. Don't, I see you reading it. You're just reading. And they say that as if it's an insult. And, and the whole problem is how does the spirit work? He works through the word as the word is expounded and, and applied to sinners for the forgiveness of sins. It is not found. It does not do its work, uh, his work, really. The spirit does not do his work through spontaneity. He does not, right? He works through the word being applied to sinners. That's it. You can do that if you have written this sermon last week. You can do that if you are reading a Luther sermon. The spirit is, is present there working, right? And so the enthusiasts lose this. The enthusiasts deny this. The enthusiasts don't understand this. And so Luther says, we need to, in part, do this to protect ourselves from these people, which he believes are heretics like outrightly. So he says, for unless there is a spiritual understanding that the spirit itself speaks through the preachers, whom I do not wish hereby to restrict for the spirit teaches better how to preach than all the postals and homilies, we will ultimately reach the point where everyone will preach his own ideas. And instead of the gospel and its exposition, we will again have sermons about fables. And this is exactly what's happening in the modern context now, today, in our churches around the world. Well, not hopefully not Lutheran churches, but in, in the churches on the streets and the churches on TV and all these kinds of telev televangelists and everything, what are they preaching, right? Well, they're, they're not writing their sermons ahead of time. They're not doing proper preparation. I know that this happens even with myself. If I don't, if I don't write a full sermon manuscript, then no matter how orthodox you are, me, you, or the other guy, you will not be able to bank anything on your idea that the Spirit indwells you, and therefore everything you say will be true, will be helpful, will be applicable, will be orthodox. You don't know that, right? We all have these kinds of failures of our mind. We lose our sharpness. We didn't sleep well enough. Um, whatever it is, we can slip up, right? And this is this is the whole point. We need to be stuck to orthodox doctrine being preached, explained, taught from the pulpit, right? And just as we were talking about last episode, um, preaching and teaching for Luther and for us, uh, well, for Luther is not and for us should not be completely disconnected from one another. They are one and the same thing, right? So... As he moves forward, this is one of the reasons why we retain the epistles and the gospels as they are given in the postals. And, and there are so few, because there are so few gifted preachers who are able to give powerful and practical exposition of a whole evangelist or some other book of the Bible, or even a small text, really, at this time. And, and you know, for some communities, some church communities, that's still the case, right? I know lots of pastors, lots of preachers, I'm not going to name any names, celebrities as well as local people, and they their sermons are not about what I would consider to be anything in the text. They are not to be uh, about anything relating to law and gospel, right? They are about all these weird ideas of sentiment, weird ideas of really like humanitarian self-betterment stuff, ideas about how God is sentimentally for you and kind of like going to help you achieve your goals and all this. I mean, we, we all know exactly what I'm talking about. Sermons that sound a lot like, um, you know, you're at your lowest, but when you're at your lowest, God is just preparing an environment for you and he's going to make your life better. How do we how do we get there? We get there from pastors not preparing their sermons well enough. 
That's the, literally, that's all it is, right? And so Luther is saying the way that we protect the, the Lutheran church from this at this moment is by having them read their sermons from the church postal. So he continues on, a public paraphrase of the Lord's Prayer shall follow the sermon. And this comes from his idea, which was also Calvin's idea, an idea which I don't really see any other Lutherans accepting as true, and I don't think that we should, that the Lord's Prayer is not to be used verbatim as much as it is to be used as a paraphrase to be expanded, a template, if you will right? Um, and a lot of the reason why it should not be used as a template is because it is the exact verbatim words of our Lord, right? There is a potency there. There is a closeness to the word itself, himself there that is going to be lost if we just, again, use that as a template to put our words in its place. And so, but anyways, he says, and an admission for those who want